Hey guys, Matt here. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be testing some more teaching, but first, as a relatively new Christian YouTuber, I am discovering that what people have said is true. Uh, when someone subscribes to your channel or hits the like button, it really does a lot for the YouTube algorithm to help get your content out there. So if you'd like to help get Christian content out to people, uh, please, if you could go ahead and take a second to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, to the testing of the teaching. Today we're going to be looking at Tavner Smith, who is the lead pastor at the Venue Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The Venue Church has uh, really grown in popularity over the last handful of years. It has become a mega church, but uh, pastor Tavner Smith recently has been in the news. Unfortunately, um, he has had some issues with sin and has stepped aside and is currently, I believe, on sabbatical, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that, but uh, some really bad things happening at the church through his leadership in particular. And my goal is actually not to uh, stockpile on top of that. You can look into it. It's horrible. It's terrible. You can look into that somewhere else. I really want to analyze and assess the teaching to show that uh, people really should not have been attending Venue Church in the first place because there is some bad doctrine that is being taught there. So today, we are going to examine his teachings. This comes from a sermon that he actually did at LV Church, which is a church in Las Vegas. And the title of the sermon, all I could see on YouTube, was called Revival Night. I will post the full link below, as always, so you can check it out. But with that, let's start assessing this teaching. Right? So if you're in build mode this year, there's something that you're going to have to commit to do. You're going to have to commit to find out what's yours and then go get it. Did you know that the world that needs Jesus is depending on you to get what's yours? Because they can't be inspired to get what's theirs unless they see somebody get what's theirs. I, uh, you know, the, 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 I pray every year that the Lord gives me a word personally. You know, we pray for a word for our church like you guys do, but I always pray separately that the Lord gives me a word personally for the year. And in 2018, as I, as I fasted and I prayed and I said, God, what is my word for this year? God gave me this word, and I hope it'll become your word tonight. He gave me this word, relentless. Relentless. It means you don't quit. It means nothing can stop you. It means you don't take no for an answer. It means that you don't stop on the doorstep to your destiny. It means that frustration doesn't get you down and make you quit. It means that, that time and process doesn't get you mad at God and make you give up. It means you just keep pushing. You keep going. You keep fighting. You keep building. You keep doing whatever you need to do until you see what you're believing for happen. All right, guys, so I want to start our examination of this teaching by looking at the point that he was trying to make early on in the clip that we need to find out what is ours and we need to go get it. Now, I want to ask a question, and I believe this is a fair question to ask. Would you be able to point me to anywhere in Scripture where this idea or this concept is very clearly taught? I think you'll find the answer is no, this idea is not found in the Bible. And the reason that's a big deal is because the Bible tells us that pastors are to preach the word. They are not to preach their own ideas, their own opinions. They are uh, bound by what is in Scripture. That is all they are authorized to teach and preach. So this idea is not found in Scripture. Therefore, Tavner Smith has to go uh, use other means to support his point or his teaching. And so what he does is he says that the unbelievers, the world will be inspired, and that's the word he uses, right? Inspired to go get what's theirs if we as Christians, as believers, will go get what's ours. Now again, is that concept found in Scripture? No, it's not. You will see that in the Bible, this idea that people are supposed to go get what's theirs is not only not found, Scripture actually speaks against it. I can think of Bible verses where Jesus said to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and not to seek after the things of this world. And so to say that you need to go get what's yours uh, is just not found 
in Scripture. And I want to point this out as well, because Tafner Smith is very clever, and I think he uses uh, words intentionally. So he says, you're going to inspire people, right? That sounds like a good thing. I'm going to inspire someone to go get what's theirs. But think about what he's actually teaching here. And I'm going to put the link below. I I encourage you, if you have the time and want to, to watch not only this sermon, but to watch some of uh, Tabner Smith's other teachings, not because you're going to hear sound doctrine, but because you will see that oftentimes when you're talking about getting what's yours or succeeding, it is earthly things. It's about getting bigger houses, more cars, more money, uh, promotions at work. It's a lot of earthly, temporal things. Okay, And so Tavner Smith here is teaching that if we can have this sort of earthly success, that it will lead other people to want to follow God. He calls it inspiring them. In reality, it is making people covet. It is making people jealous and desire what you have. So let's look at a couple of Bible verses. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. This is the tenth of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. See, guys, this is really twisted what Tavner Smith is doing. The Bible tells us that we are not to be greedy. We are not to seek after selfish gain. Yet Tavner Smith is painting it in a way where he's saying, listen, you should do these things because that's the best thing you can do. You're going to inspire other people. Guys, I think it's pretty clear that God is not going to encourage sin as a way of evangelizing and bringing people into the kingdom. Okay, so the idea that somehow we can just be really successful, other people will be jealous, and that will lead them to the kingdom is not good. Coveting and being jealous is sinful. He goes on in this passage to talk about being relentless, and his exact quote was, Be relentless until you see what you are believing for happen. So you just need to keep pursuing, keep on going until what you're believing for comes true. Again, no specific instructions like, what should I be believing for? It's whatever you want to believe for until it comes true. Let's look at a passage of scripture from James chapter 4, starting in verse 2. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So oftentimes people will go to that passage of scripture and say, you do not have because you do not ask. We just have to be relentless and asking God and believing and it will come true. But did you notice on the front part of that verse, of that passage, it was talking about coveting and being jealous and how that's sinful. And on the back half, it says, yeah, you don't even get because you're asking for the wrong reasons. You want worldly things. And so Tavner Smith here is attempting to encourage people to be greedy, to be idolatrous, and uh, to, to covet. And this is wrong. This is the exact opposite of what Scripture teaches. All right, guys, with that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into our next clip where he's going to be going a little bit further and what he means in being relentless uh, with this message. Before I get ahead of myself, I want to read our scripture, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, I just want to read three verses, Joshua chapter 1, 1 through 3. And after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. I just feel like I'm supposed to say, the time has come for you to lead. The Israelites across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them, and this is verse 3, what I want to, this is the verse I want you to hang on to for this year. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. Are you going to build this year? Where are you going to build? Wherever you set your foot. If you're relentless. There's a couple things you got to be relentless in doing. Number one is this. Write it down. Don't forget it. Number one, you have to be relentlessly convinced. Come on, you have to be relentlessly convinced 
that your God is a promise keeper. All right, guys, so what we had there is one of the most common tactics that pastors will use whenever they are doing a false teaching, and that is they will take a passage out of context. That's exactly what's happening, and I want to show it to you. So Tavner Smith was very clearly teaching out of Joshua chapter 1, and he was saying that you know Moses was now dead, and God did speak to Joshua and said, you know, you're the leader now, and it's time for you to take the people into the promised land. And then he he even uh, quoted verse 3, where the Lord says to Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Now, what is the context of what's happening here? Well, God is speaking to Joshua, one person, the leader of the Israelites. He had made a very specific promise at that time to those people, And now he was speaking to one person, Joshua, and saying, I am going to fulfill the promise that I made to these people, and you are going to go in there, and you are going to get every place where you set your foot. Now, we can understand from the context that he was not speaking, God was not speaking to every person at every period of history, that everywhere you set your foot, you are going to have that area, which is what Tabner Smith is teaching. And I know why people buy into this, because it sounds good. It's exactly what 2 Timothy 4 says people will do. They will listen to teaching that is going to to scratch their ears because they have itching ears. They just want to hear positive things, right? So it sounds really good. But I want to show you what it would look like to take a passage of Scripture out of context, but to not use a really happy one. And this is one of the points I'm making. How come you would never hear someone preach Jeremiah 11, 11 in the same way that Tavner Smith just preached Joshua 1. So listen to this. This is Jeremiah 11. The people have been unfaithful to God and the Lord is speaking. In, in verse 11, he says, therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Now, could you imagine Tavner Smith getting up and saying, guys, Jeremiah 11, 11, Uh, The Lord says he's going to bring destruction and disaster. And even if you cry out, he's not going to listen to you. Well, no, he wouldn't do that. And if I were to say that to Tavner Smith, I'm sure he would say, well, that's not to us. That was to the people then. And I'd go, exactly. And that is exactly what is happening with Joshua 1. This is not a promise for all believers that wherever you go and whatever you do, God is going to give you that land and, and going to give you whatever you want. This is ripping a passage of scripture out of context to make it sound good and to tickle the ears of the people to make them feel good. This is not rightly handling God's word. Now, I also want to point out something that he did at the very end, and this is something that you will also commonly see. Tavner Smith actually preached a point that I would say is a true point. So it's a a truth that he is stating, but he is absolutely false in his application of that truth. And so towards the end of the clip, he said, you must understand that our God is a promise keeper. Guys, that's 100% true. Our God is a promise keeper. He will keep every promise he has made. But did you notice that in context, he was saying, so you can believe the promise of Joshua 1 Everywhere you step your foot, that land is going to be yours. Guys, God is a promise keeper. Unfortunately, Joshua 1 is not a promise that has been made to you. And this is something that will very regularly happen. A pastor could make a point that is solid, but when they go to apply it, they are not applying it in the correct way. And so I've already shown that Joshua 1 was not being used in context. So to then come around and say, God is a promise keeper. He's going to fulfill that promise. God is a promise keeper, and he did fulfill that promise to Joshua and to the people of Israel when he led them in to the promised land. And in fact, I want to show another example of this with our next clip, because Tavner Smith is actually going to attempt to uh, tell the people what a couple of the promises of God are in their life. And we're going to look at them, and I'm going to show you how these promises that he's quoting are actually not promises for us today. Let's check it out. Can I make you one guarantee today? I promise you that what God says will come to pass. 
I can't promise you it'll be on your timetable. I can't promise you it'll go the way you thought it would go. I can't promise you that you will like the process. He's a promise keeper. But it goes beyond the Bible because he doesn't just promise people in the Bible things. He's promised you things. He's promised you things that you're having trouble believing. You know, you don't think you have any purpose in your life, but in Jeremiah 29, 11, he said that he has plans for you. There are plans to prosper you. There are plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, the enemy's trying to convince you that, that, that you need to be afraid for your kids or for your safety or for your provision or for all of this other stuff. And did you know that he promised you in Psalm chapter 91 that though a thousand fall at your side and though 10,000 fall at your right hand, whatever's going on will not come near you. He said he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways and you will not even stub your toe in the process. All right, so as I already mentioned, here we have another example of Tabner Smith making a true point. God is a promise keeper and saying, hey, God has promised things to you as well. Those are very true. And then he goes on to give two examples of the promises that God has given to you allegedly. And I want to show you that though it might sound great, are those promises for you in the way that Tabner Smith has described it? Well, let's look. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know this is the verse that everybody loves to use and everybody, oh, it's so encouraging, but let's look at the context of what is happening here in Jeremiah 29. So this is actually at the point where the Israelites are about to go into exile for 70 years. And, and so let's start in verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. So notice that the Lord is speaking to the nation of Israel and he is telling them that he has plans for them as a nation, even though they are about to go into exile for 70 years. So this verse cannot mean all people always, oh man, you're going to prosper and everything's going to go exactly the way you want it to go. Well, how do I know? Because even to the people that God is speaking to at this point, God's saying you're about to be in exile for 70 years. This was a promise to the people of Israel that although God was disciplining them for their rebellion and for their sin, that he still had plans for them as his people, that he still was going to bring them out and he still was going to bless the nation of Israel as they repented and as they sought after him. So Tavner Smith making this promise to the nation of Israel at that time about us is a bad application. He then went on to quote Psalm 91. And here is what is so interesting and so helpful to me here. Do you know that the passage that he quotes in Psalm 91 is the same passage of scripture that Satan used when he was tempting Jesus? The same passage that Satan twisted and Jesus rebuked him for. Let's look at it in Matthew 4. This is starting in verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Satan is twisting this scripture in Psalm 91 to mean something it does not mean, and Jesus is correcting him. So for Tabner Smith to use Psalm 91 and to use it in the context of what he was saying is that no harm, nothing bad will happen to you is not a correct understanding, not only of that uh, psalm, but of scripture in general. And in fact, I want to read to you a couple of quotes from commentaries on Psalm 91 done by some really great men of God. Um, I want to start by looking at Charles Spurgeon, who is widely regarded as one of the best pastors ever. His commentary on Psalm 91, he says this, it is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. Ill to him is no ill, but only good in a mysterious form. 
Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. Death is his gain. No evil in the strict sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. And so what is he saying? Charles Spurgeon is not saying that this verse means that nothing bad in a worldly sense will happen to you. He's saying if you truly believe in Christ and you're trusting in the Lord, even the things that appear to be bad on the outside are actually working for your good. So if you get sick, which you can get sick, if you die, which you will die, that actually brings you into the presence of God. This is a beautiful promise that no matter what happens, trials, afflictions, which will come, that is a promise of scripture many times over that you will suffer, you will have trials, you will have persecutions, that God is going to use that for good. I want to read another uh, comment here, uh, another commentary from Psalm 91. It says this, in a strange way, we are grateful for Satan's attempt in Matthew 4 because it helps us better understand Psalm 91. We see that it does not give absolute promises for every believer in every circumstance, but beautiful promises of God's protection, comfort, and care that are specifically received and applied in the believer by the Holy Spirit. So this is not a specific promise for every believer in every circumstance. You know, you're not going to stub your toe, he said. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. It's a beautiful promise if you wanted to apply it correctly, if you're trusting in Christ, that there is protection. But protection does not mean that you won't have troubles. Again, Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have troubles. You will have trials. You will have difficulties. You will have persecutions. So again, Tabner Smith starts with the truth. Man, God is a promise keeper and he has promises for you, but then he goes on to give promises that either aren't specifically for you or he's explaining them in ways that are not true. And this is the danger with false teaching. All right, guys, we have one more clip that I want to look at. So let's go ahead and get to it now. Lord's really showed me something that I thought was really cool. It's kind of changed the way that I pray. Is he showed me, he took me to Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And it says this, throw it up on the screen. Don't worry about anything. That's easy to say, right? Instead, pray about everything. Listen to this. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. It is then... So tell him what you need. That takes care of the first part. We boldly came before him. Now here's the second part, thanksgiving. Thank him for all he's done. So when we come boldly and then we come with thanksgiving, what happens? The peace of God, which exceeds anything we can understand, will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you what the Lord showed me. Thank him for all he has done does not mean that we come before him and before we ask for anything, we thank him for everything he's done in our life that we've seen up until that point. See, here's what you got to understand about God. God does not live in time with us. God lives outside of time and eternity, which means he's not going through your life with you surprised at everything that is going on with you. He has seen your life from beginning to end. Are you with me? Which means this, when Jesus died on the cross, he said these three words at the end. It is what? Finished. Then he ascended to heaven, he sat on the right hand of the Father, and he will not get up again until it's time to come back and get us. If that's the case, if he said it is finished and then he sat down, then it means what this verse is talking about is not just thanking God for what he's done, meaning everything you've seen him do. It means thanking God for all he has done means that you have the revelation that everything that's ever going to be done is already done. So you're not coming before him saying, thank you that last week you made my fever go away from my child. It's meaning this. I thank you, God, that you put this dream in my heart. And you wouldn't have put this dream in my heart had it not already been finished in the first place. Because you don't operate like us. You don't draw out the map and then build the building. You build the building and then draw out the map. So the fact that I have a call means it's already done. So thank you that everything I need to get done what's already done is already done. I don't have to beg you. I just got to thank you that I'm going to see what you've already done. I 
thank you that my child is healed. Not because I saw you heal somebody else, but because you gave me a child. All right, so with this last clip, I do want to focus on one major thing. But first, a, a couple of small problems I had. Well, I shouldn't say small, but problems I had at the beginning. Uh, he mentioned when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. And he really seemed to say that that applied to everything that Jesus was ever going to do. It was finished on that cross. That's not really a right understanding of Jesus saying it is finished. He was saying that his work in redemption was finished, that he was offering his uh, life as a sacrifice, and he was taking upon himself the wrath of God for all who would believe. So that was finished. So I, I have a problem with that. I also don't understand him saying Philippians 4 when it says, give thanks for all that God has done, when he says, well, that doesn't mean you thank him for what he's done in the past. That absolutely does mean that you thank him for what he has done in the past. Uh, so I, I don't understand that, but I really want to focus on one main thing, as I said. Here again, we have Tavner Smith starting with something that is true and then applying it in a very, very wrong way. And so he talked about God being outside of time. And he said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically everything that is going to happen in your life is basically already done because God is sovereign and God is outside of time. So it will happen. And guys, I, I would agree with that. Everything that is going to take place in my life is already done. God already knows it in his sovereignty and in his providence. He has already ordained it to be. He's going to ensure that it comes to pass. And so I agree with that. But let's look at the application. And again, guys, this is why this is so dangerous, because you can start with a true premise and then apply it in a way that is totally false. So Tavner Smith then went on to say, because everything that is going to happen in my life is already done, he specifically mentions the dream that is in your heart. And God would not have planted that dream in your heart unless it was already done. Guys, this is a false teaching. That is not true. First off, how do we know the dream in my heart? How, how am I supposed to know if that is from God or not? Well, according to Tavner Smith, I am just to assume that if I have a dream and I desire something, that it means it's from God. Do you remember the verse we already read in James 4? It talked about you desiring, but you didn't have because you're coveting, you're greedy, you're doing all these sinful things. Let's look at a verse from Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Your heart is deceitful. There is a very good chance that if you have a desire in your heart, it may not be from the Lord. Now, notice I'm saying may not be. I'm not saying that every desire you've ever had is always evil. No, you might have some really good desires. But to say that if you have a dream in your heart, God planted it there and he's going to make it come true is just not accurate, guys. I think if you're a sincere Christian, I have a desire in my heart that every person in the world would come to know Christ. But scripture makes it very clear that not everyone is going to come to know him. So we can't make that connection. Plus, as I said already, just because I have a desire and a dream in my heart does not mean that it has been placed there automatically from God because the heart is deceitful and wicked. In fact, let's look at another verse from Proverbs 19. This is verse 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So you notice that there's a contrast. You might have plans in your heart, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Meaning your plans that you have in your heart might not be according to the Lord's purpose. That is why we are taught by the Lord Jesus himself to pray, your will be done. Guys, this is some dangerous teaching. Um, if you notice this sort of teaching going on in your church, I recommend that you find a new church. Um, one of the things I've noticed, I'll comment quickly, is that there used to be a huge problem, and there still is a big problem with prosperity teaching people, you're going to get wealthy, you're going to get rich. I've noticed some people have changed the language slightly, and it's no longer about getting wealthy, it's about fulfilling your destiny. If you are in a church that is constantly teaching you about fulfilling your destiny in your dreams, I venture to say you are not sitting under sound biblical teaching because that is not something that we see emphasized 
in Scripture. So guys, I recommend stay away from Tavner Smith. This is not sound doctrine. This is not sound teaching. I encourage you to find a church that uh, will teach you the Word of God correctly. And more than that, guys, read your Bible. Read your Bible by yourself. Read it in context and ask the Lord to give you wisdom as you do so. All right, guys, I hope this has been helpful to you. Again, if you could take a second to subscribe and hit the like button, it really helps to get the content out there. So I would greatly appreciate it. Until next time, God bless.